From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, This is Hillary Fuchs, CPA. You left word for me to call Mr. Dollar. I don't seem to recall the name. I'm with Universal Adjusters. They asked me to look into this Wendover claim. Universal Adjusters? Insurance Adjusters? That's right, insurance. I understand you filed a claim in Mrs. Wendover's name. Mrs. Wendover hired me to handle her affairs a few days ago. Who do you want to talk to, me or Mrs. Wendover? Anybody who can make me understand why Mrs. Wendover let a $50,000 policy lie around for two years before she filed a claim. I'll try. I don't know whether I can convince you or not, but I'll try. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, 518 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. Expense account item one, $92.50, airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Miami Beach, Florida. My plane got in at 11 p.m., so I went to a hotel and got some sleep. I put in a call to Hillary Fuchs, certified public accountant, as soon as I woke up. Then I had some breakfast and took a cab out to his office. It was a pleasant four-mile trip along a beautiful white sanded ocean front, and it cost me, Adam, two, three bucks even. Come on in here, Dollar. The air conditioner's working here. Hillary Fuchs was a big man in his late 40s. He was semi-bald, had a good sunburn, and smelled faintly of scotch whiskey. The office he led me into was cool and dark and elegantly furnished in bamboo knickknacks. The desk was cluttered with a stack of financial statements and legal papers. This is quite a thing, I guess, Dollar. By the way, I didn't find any universal insurance adjusters in the phone book. We're located in Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford? You're a long way from home, Dollar. They sent you all the way to Miami Beach about this? Yep. Seems like a pretty expensive way to handle it. Pretty expensive claim, $50,000. Would it do any good to tell you it's legitimate? Sure, but I'm hired to check it out just the same. (laughs) In other words, you don't believe me. Well, look at it our way, Mr. Fuchs. The claim came into the office day before yesterday, and we have 72 hours to act on it. Okay. What can I do? First off, tell me your connection with Mrs. Wendover. She hired me to put her business affairs in order about 10 days ago. First time I ever saw her. She said the Treasury Department had advised her to get some expert help. They were on her about back taxes, and that's it. Oh, uh-huh, I see. Tell me about Noah Wendover's death. He died two years ago, last April 14th. By the way, it's just coming to me. Did you people... I mean, did the insurance company know anything about him being dead until that claim came in? No. (laughs) No wonder they sent you all the way from Hartford. Well, uh, Wendover and his wife took a party of eight out on their boat for a ten-day cruise. Wendover had an attack of appendicitis at sea. There wasn't a doctor aboard. The appendix burst, and he died before they could make the nearest port. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to the original question... Why all this time before Mrs. Wendover filed claim for benefits? Well, you really got to know Mrs. Wendover, I guess. She's a little crazy, a little wacky, a little strange. These are your impressions of her? It's a consensus. I asked her around after she came here the other day. The story is that she and Wendover had a pretty good thing in their marriage. They were wild about each other. They spent money like water, and they had plenty of it to spend. Then one day he died. Kind of threw her. Maybe it's still throwing her. I don't know. Sure, sure. Somewhere along the line, in the last year, Mrs. Wendover's met somebody else. I don't know who he is because I wasn't paying any attention when she mentioned his name. But she's sort of coming out of it and she's going to marry him. Uh So she wants to get her business affairs in order. From the look of things, nobody's done much about them since Wendover's death. You see all that stuff on the desk? Yeah, I noticed it. It's all hers. She brought it to me in three big hat boxes. Stocks, bonds, bills, deeds, I don't know what all. I know she's in a little trouble with the government, not because she hasn't got the money to pay them, but just because she hasn't bothered with anything like that. Hmm? Anyhow, one of the first things I came across was the insurance policy thrown in there with all the rest of the stuff. And look, you see these checks? Yeah. Almost $90,000, dividends on some oil stock. Doesn't even bother to open her mail or cash her checks. (laughs) Well... A lot of people around the country, including your insurance company, are going to be startled when I finish straightening all this out. I sent the policy claim in as a matter of course. That's 
My explanation for it being two years late. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good explanation. Look here. She completely forgot she loaned an $8,000 automobile to a friend in Tampa 14 months ago. I asked her about it, and she said she thought she'd left it at the filling station. What? And here, the boat went over Didon, worth $60,000. She sold it to a fisherman last year for $5,000. Yeah, I get the idea, Mr. Fuchs. Yeah. So you filed the insurance claim in her name along with a dozen other matters that should have been taken care of two years ago. Yeah. You play golf? No. Well, I do, and I'm tired of looking at this pile of stuff. Mind if I look at it? Help yourself. All yours. I'll be at the club. Do whatever you have to. By the way, what do you have to do? Verify this death certificate in the coroner's report. Well, then you will honor the claim? I'll file my report, and it's up to the insurance company to do as they see fit. You're kind of cagey, aren't you? Uh, that's why they pay me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Mr. Fuchs. Yeah? Is there some kind of bank balance in this stuff, current? Oh, you'll find it there, but I'll tell you, in cash, Mrs. Wendover's worth about $950,000. I doubt very much if she's trying to cheat the insurance company out of 50000 You can't ever tell, though, can you, Mr. Fuchs? No, nope, can't ever tell. After he left, I got on the telephone and talked to officials about the coroner's autopsy and the death certification on Noah Wendover. They all seem to be in order. Then I went through the papers on Fuchs' desk. They seem to be in enough disorder to verify what he told me about Elise Wendover. I left Fuchs' office about 4.30 and went back to my hotel, carrying a picture of a woman who had existed in a state of limbo for two years or more, so far as responsibility and attention to business went. Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hillary Fuchs, can you come over to my office right away? I just left there. What's up? Mrs. Wendover, she's having a fit. Come on over. Expense account item three. Three more bucks, more cab fare, back to Hillary Fuchs' office. I pulled up in front at exactly 5.30 and noticed a 1956 white Cadillac convertible parked in front. For no reason at all, I took 30 seconds to peek inside. The registration told me the car belonged to Elise Blair Wendover. She had left her purse on the seat and the keys in the ignition. A mink stole was thrown carelessly over the back of the seat. Anybody could have taken the stole, the purse, the car, the whole works. Mrs. Wendover was living up to her advance notices. Come in, come in. Fuchs looked pale and shaken. He fumbled around for a cigarette until I handed him one of mine. He lit it up and tried to get a grip on himself. Mrs. Wendover's in there. Well, what happened? Well, I had some papers for her to sign, and she dropped in a little while ago. Uh-huh. I told her about you. I, I explained to her it was certainly reasonable the insurance company would want to investigate a claim that had been delayed 25 months. Well? She blew up, got kind of hysterical about it, said she wanted to see you right away, that she had something to tell you. Go easy on her, will you? Well, why do you say that? Oh, it's just that... Well, if I'm wrong about her, I'm glad, but I don't think I'm wrong when I say she's right on the edge, just on the edge of it. it Feeling better, Mrs. Wendover? The pale girl with the coal black hair, seated stiffly in the chair in front of Hillary Fuchs' desk, was not feeling better here. She could have been 16 or 36. It depended on where you were standing when you looked at her. She had a mouth that was too full, shoulders too wide for the strapless sundress, a pair of sandals, a clanking costume bracelet, and black eyes, round, big, bright, too bright. This is Mr. Dollar, Mrs. Wendover. I understand you're investigating my husband's death. I'm here to verify the facts so that eastern states can act on your claim. Don't you believe he's dead? Yes. Don't you? Oh, yes. I saw him die. Yes, he's dead. How much money do you owe me? The claim is for $50,000. Will you pay it? Well, I, I presume it will be paid from all I've seen so far. Of course, that part of it's up to the insurance company. Of course. And they have men sitting at desks reading reports about claims all day long. Uh, yes. My dad owned an insurance company once, you know. Those men sitting at their desks, even my dad sat at a desk. I wonder something. Would one of those men sitting at one of those desks write, okay, on my claim for Noah's benefits if he knew about me? Uh, sit down, Mrs. Wendover. Maybe you'd like a drink. You have one, Mr. Fuchs, would they? Well, I, I have to be indefinite about that, too, Mrs. Wendover. 
What would put a question in the mind of an adjuster if he knew about you? I'm indolent, and I'm irresponsible. Mr. Fuchs can tell you that. I'm not quite dependable, am I, Mr. Fuchs? Oh, we're getting straightened out, Mrs. Wendover. And then, of course, that wouldn't make a difference. I mean, not really. A great many irresponsible, indolent, undependable people file claims. There's something else. I'm a curse. Are you? Oh, yes. It's a very bad thing, a curse. People around me, people I love, just seem to die. Why do you think you're a curse? Noah died, and I loved him. And Daddy, I loved him. And my brother Jim, all dead. No one can stay alive around me. I thought I should tell you that. Yeah, well, I appreciate it, Mrs. Wendover. Well... And we don't have anything more to discuss. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Fuchs. Oh, wait a minute. Johnny, hey, where are you going? I'm going to drive her home. You were right. She's on the edge of something. I can't quite figure it yet. Brother was killed in Korea. Her father died of a heart attack ten years ago. I got that much from the papers on your desk. Lord, where'd she ever get the idea? Oh, I don't know. I've heard of things like this happening. I'll phone you later. Right. Wait a minute. I'll drive you home, Mrs. Wendover. Oh, that'll be nice. She smiled brightly, still too brightly, and we drove along. She didn't tell me which way to turn, what direction to go, and I didn't ask her. I liked it that way, no one saying a word. I was listening to something else anyhow, something inside of me, loud like a cannon firing twice a second. It was my heart making all the noise. Oh, it's happened a couple of times before, and it meant trouble coming up. I knew it. My heart never makes a mistake. Mr. Dollar, do you think he'll die too? Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... Right out in the broad daylight, I have a look at the tears of night. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hillary Fuchs, Dollar. How's Mrs. Wendover? So far, so good. Dollar, can you talk? Yeah, sure. She's in the other room. Do you think she's all right? Mentally, I mean? I think she's all right enough to get by. I think she's scared to death of something or somebody. That business of the curse? Yeah. You know there isn't anything to that. There's something to it for her. She thinks she's somehow responsible for her husband's death, for her father's death, and for her brother's death. On the way here, she mentioned, just like that, that someone else was going to die. Or words to that effect. Who? I don't know. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account, submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. It had started as a routine investigation. A claim filed for $50,000 on the death of Noah Wendover, Miami Beach, Florida. The question, why the two-year delay in making claim? The answer turned out to be interesting. Briefly, it involved a distraught woman who had neglected not only the insurance, but everything else in her life for two years. A woman obsessed with the idea she was a curse. Do you like soda or water? Uh, soda, please. Thanks. Cheers. Good luck. Mm. What's your name again? Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, that's right. Mr. Fuchs introduced us, didn't he? Do you think he'll be able to straighten out all my business affairs for me? Yes, I think so, Mrs. Wendover. Including the insurance? Including the insurance, yes. Well, you're worried about the claim, aren't you? (laughs) 
Well, I, I'm paid to worry about it. I'm not so worried now as when I first came to Miami Beach. I think I understand why it took all this time for the claim to be filed. You mean you've met me and you think I'm kind of... You know, not all there or something. Well... I suppose Mr. Fuchs explained how badly I've managed things for the last two years. He showed me how you've let your affairs go to the devil, if that's what you mean. I'm glad you finally turned it all over to him. I think he'll take care of it for you. I behaved rather badly in Mr. Fuchs' office, didn't I? Well, I wouldn't say that. Poor Mr. Fuchs. He was frightened, I think. I don't know what it is, really. I mean, he mentioned that you were in town investigating my claim on Noah's death. I felt I should talk to you. That's why I had him call you. I wanted to tell you about the curse. There's no such thing, you know, Mrs. Wendover. I know. I know. I couldn't have been responsible for Dad's death. It was a heart attack many years ago. I was away at school in New York, and Jim, my brother being killed in Korea, I couldn't have had anything to do with that. And Noah, oh, I loved him very much. I'm not cursed, am I? No, no, you certainly aren't. All of these deaths around you have been tragic, doubly so, because you seem to have been very fond of the people. But you aren't responsible in any way. I like you. You're very nice. If you have any questions you want to ask me about Noah, I'd be glad to answer them. I really would. I'm all right now. Really, I am. Well, when we left Mr. Fuchs' office, you talked a lot about that curse business. Yes, I'm ashamed. Were you still thinking of that when you spoke to me in the car? Did I speak to you in the car? Yes. You know... I can't remember riding in the car at all. I've been standing here talking to you, and I've been wondering all this time how we got here. Do you mind if I help myself? No. We drove over together from Hillary Fuchs' office. I drove you here. Oh. Oh. Some things I just blank out. I've talked to a psychiatrist, you know. I mean, I've been under treatment for several months. He says I established a strong pattern when Noah died of shutting things out, of just forcing my mind to become blank. He's trying to help me get over it. What did I say in the car? You said you were cursed and you wondered if he would die. Oh, dear. Who's he? Teddy. Teddy, uh... Teddy Davis. I'm going to marry him when he asks me. Oh. And I know he will. I love him very much. Well, why do you think... Teddy might die. Because of people dying around me that I love? He doesn't believe in the curse, does he? Oh, no. He's something like you, in a way. Nice. He makes me laugh at it. He says it's ridiculous. Because it is. Somehow I feel comforted. Now, look. You marry this fellow the minute he asks you and forget about being cursed and everything else. He'll take care of you. I better go now. Mr. Dollar. Yes? Yes. Thank you. I need sometimes very much to talk to someone like you. Thank you. J. Dollar, Oracle. Go out and marry so-and-so and live happily ever after. I like the little kiss she gave me. I like the way she squeezed my hand. I like the perfume she was wearing. I like the way the intense, hard brightness had gone out of her black eyes and she was just a nice woman being a woman. I liked all that. What I didn't like was the idea that she could be the other way, believing in the curse and believing she was somehow responsible for people dying. When I left her, I knew that part wasn't ended. I knew it would come back. Come on in, Dollar. I sort of stuck around wondering if you'd come back here. How is she? She's okay now. Fuchs, I'm sending in my report on this policy tonight. I'm recommending they honor it. I've got enough verification. Okay, that's fine. I sure appreciate your help on this, Dollar. Let me buy you dinner. No, no, thanks. I'm getting the first plane back to Hartford. Why not wait until tomorrow? You've got a reason, haven't you? Yeah, I guess so. Mrs. Wendover? Oh, I've met people like her before. Don't ask me where or when, but I've seen them. And there isn't anything to a curse, but trouble seems to follow them. Big trouble. My business here is practically finished. I just want to get out and get away. Can I use your office for about an hour? Sure. It's all yours. Dollar... I feel the same way. 
I spent a half an hour typing up my report on the Wendover claim and another ten minutes on the phone asking for an airplane back to Hartford. They said they'd call me right back and I poured myself some of Fuchs' whiskey and sat down to stare out at the night. Lights burned up and down the white beach. People strolled up and down, looking at the water, holding hands. And I was sitting alone in Hillary Fuchs' office, waiting for a phone call and thinking about a curse. Hi. Hi. Who are you? Anybody else here? No, why? You were kind of late. So do you. What's on your mind? You? Costigan wants to see you right away. I'm supposed to take you over. Whoever Costigan is, tell him he doesn't want me. You don't tell Sam things like that. You know, it's been a long time since I shook in my boots when a skinny hood like you stood around acting tough. If you've got some business with Hillary Fuchs, look him up at his home. This is Fuchs' office. You're behind his desk. You'll do. Now, come on, mister, and don't show me how loud a certified public accountant can growl. I just might swing this thing on your head. <laughs> That's better. You got a hat? No. I know Costigan wants to talk to you, but I'd sure like to belt you on just for the practice. I'm not Hillary Fuchs. Come on, let's go. Hey, yo! You're going to break my arm! I'd like to, just for the practice. Now then, it's Costigan. Is he the one from Chicago? Uh, Sam's been there. Answer. The Sam Costigan kicked out of Chicago a few years ago? Yeah, yeah. What does he want to see Fuchs about? The Wendover dame. What? Something about the Wendover dame. I don't know what it is. He just wants to see you. Okay, what's your name? Frank Scanlon. Here. You put this thing in your pocket. Pull it out again in front of me and I'll brain you. Now, let's go. Huh? Now I want to see Sam. Well, sure. Sure. Anything you say. I followed Frank Scanlon out of the building to a waiting car. A black packet with side curtains. It was a nice touch for this day and age. But it didn't make much sense. None of it did. It was illogical in the beginning, middle, and end. Most of all, I didn't make much sense. I should have been in my room packing. Instead, I was on my way to see an old-time grifter and hoodlum named Sam Costigan. Because someone had mentioned the name Wendover. You want to smoke? I use my own. Suit yourself, fella. Scanlon was a thin one with sharp, narrowed eyes. Too much padding in the shoulders, too much snap to the brim of his hat, too much point to the toe of his shoes. The thirty-eight had taken away from him and handed back made a considerable bulge in the front of his coat. About six miles out of Miami Beach, he turned off the main highway onto a dirt road. About a mile of that and up ahead, we saw lights. The lights became a fine old colonial mansion, every room aglow. Two or three guards were watching the entrance to the front. They all needed shaves. No one said anything. Yeah? It's me, Feely. Oh, uh, this here is Hillary Fuchs, uh... Sam wants to see him. Come on in. How are you feeling, Mr. Feely? <laughs> what kinds of punks are on nowadays? I wouldn't get frisky with him if I was you. He's a pretty touchy fella. It's so. Yeah. Out oh, this way. Come on. He led me into the main foyer where a hat check girl with a lot of red hair stood ready for the evening's business, which hadn't begun yet. On the right, what had been the dining room of the old house was now a circular bar that could seat 25 or 30. To the left in what had been the parlor and library, I counted two crap tables, two roulette tables, and two blackjack stands. Beyond all this, on a screen porch, a five-piece combo made music. A few tables and head waiters stood around looking bored. Scanlon led me upstairs, and we stopped in front of a wide white door marked private. I thought he was going to knock. Instead, he whirled around very quickly and stuck the same old thirty-eight about two inches into my ribs. Now let's stand steady. Feely! Eddie! You giving you trouble, Frankie? Nah. I, uh... I will, Buster. I'll give you plenty of trouble if you want it. Hear how he talks to me? I'll crack him up a little for you if you like, Frankie. Nah. He got business with Sam right now. We'll take care of our business with him later on. However you say it, Frankie. I just wanted you to remember that. I will. The same way I remember a dirty newspaper story. <laughs> know something? I'm looking forward to you. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, there is a curse that goes with the Wendover name. Goes wherever it is. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, 
Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I'll take that wise guy. Mr. Frankie Scanlon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell him. What was that you yelled on the phone? You heard it. I heard you say Johnny Dollar. I told you a long time back I wasn't Hillary Fuchs. You told me a lot of things. If I'm going to see Costigan, trot him out. Just open the door and walk right in. I'm right behind you, see? Hello, Sam. Johnny. Johnny Dollar. What's he doing here, Frankie? You... You mean this isn't Fuchs? Get out of here! Get out of here before I throw something at you! You heard the man, Frankie, blow. No, sit down, Johnny. I won't bother shaking hands. You tried to put me in jail the last time we met. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Miami Beach. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, 518 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. I'm going to sit down here behind my desk and have a drink, Johnny. And while I'm having it, I'm going to ask you a question. Save your breath. I'll answer it anyhow, Sam. Sam Costigan sat hunched behind the big mahogany desk, glaring at me with a pair of small pig eyes half hidden in a beefy red face. Both hands rested out in front of him, flat. I told him how I'd come to Miami Beach to look into an insurance claim made by Elise Wendover, how I'd been in the office of Hillary Fuchs, her business manager, when Frank Scanlon had walked in, mistaken me for Fuchs, waved a gun under my nose, and insisted I come with him to see Costigan. So here I was, and so what about it? Ah, uh, help yourself, Johnny. Well, that's a pretty nice joint, Sam. How long have you been in business in Florida? Oh, about two years. How's the gross? Isn't it as good as running beer in Chicago, but Tim days are gone forever. I make out all right. Two crap tables to rule that table, a couple of games. A bar and restaurant break it up even. Man, I gotta be careful. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Well, you seem to have enough muscle outside and around to keep you comfy and cozy. Yeah, punks, all of them. Look at that Frankie Scanlon who dragged you over here. Crazy, that one. But he's the best of the lot, the best I can get nowadays. Not a good muscle living the business. You could retire. Yeah, I might do that one of these days. No. Tell me about your hookup with this Wendover dame, huh? No hookup, Sam. She claimed benefits on her husband's life insurance. The claim should have been made two years ago. I investigated. It's okay. Made it? Yeah. Screwball, huh? In some ways. She's all right. Well, maybe it's as good you're here as this Fuchs guy. I wanted him to handle some business for hers, but uh, maybe you can handle it. Yeah, you ever see this before? No. Oh, it's a little bit of necklace called the Tears of Night. It's worth a big hunk of cash. These four diamonds are good stuff. Your friend Miss Wendover left it here a week or so ago when she went for a plunge at the roulette table. Anything the same? It's a very pretty necklace, Sam. Okay. We both know she's screwy, a widow with a lot of dough, and a boyfriend named Teddy. Teddy Davis, he paints. Well, she sent me a check for the five G's she lost that night, and I wanted Fuchs to take his thing back to her, but then I got you instead. I want you to take it to her, huh? How about it? Is that all? That's all. I got my dough, she gets her tears of night back. I couldn't trust any of my punks with it, and I don't like to be seen in public, so uh, you just take it back, huh? It's very simple. <laughs> Why? Don't ever go on the stage, Sam. Why not? You can act, but you can't lie. You just can't lie at all. And it takes a good liar to be a good actor. Now that you've told me how simple it is, suppose you give me the unexpurgated sequel. All right, so a check bounce. Oh, stop it, Sam. She can't issue a check without a countersignature by Hillary Fuchs. He hasn't issued one check on her account since he took it over ten days ago. So if this thing is hers, explain it all to me, will you? The way it is. <sighs> I want another drink. Yeah, you're right, Johnny. There wasn't any check. Miss Wendover called me a couple of hours ago and said if I didn't have this thing back to her tonight, she'd call a load of cops and come out and tear us to join apart. 
She sounded like she'd do it, too. I mean, well, you, you matter. You, you can't tell what she'll do from a minute to the next. Screw her, you know? Not so screwy if she dropped 5000 and left that. And now she gets it back for nothing. I just want to get it off my hands. If she came out here with a cop, I'd be closed for the season. And I'm getting old. Hey, you, know, you know where she lives? Mm-hmm. I was there earlier tonight. Yeah, take the ice tour, and I'll chalk it up to experience, huh? Then you can grab a cab back and come on back out here, and I'll see that you have a good time on the house. How about it? I'll take it to her, but I won't come back here, Sam. No, Scanlon, Feely, them guys, huh? They worry you? You do. What? I don't believe your last story either. The only thing I believe is that this is Mrs. Wendover's necklace. So I'll take it to her. Sam. Yeah? You better get someone beside Feely at that table after this. You're telling me. You're telling me. He was mopping his face when I closed the door and went downstairs. By that time, the customers had started to roll in. Young, fresh-faced men with sallow eyes and quick movements, anxious to step up to the tables and lose money. Women in strapless dresses, anxious to show off their newest suntans and help whatever man they were with lose money. Old men, old women, dressed to the teeth. It was a sick old scene from a sick old play. Expense account item four, six dollars. Cab fare from Sam Costigan's gambling club to Elise Wendover's apartment. Oh, Teddy, I thought you'd never get here. The performance begins at ten o'clock, and you know how the traffic is, and if we're going to have a bite, do we... You aren't Teddy at all, are you? I'm afraid not, Mrs. Wendover. Where's Teddy? I don't know. Oh. What are you looking at? Your throat. Really, Mr. Mr. Dollar. Johnny Dollar. I met you in Hillary Fuchs' office. We talked here later on. Remember? Of course I remember. Well, really, Mr. Dollar, I'm only waiting for Teddy to come by so we can make the first show at the plaza. I better telephone him, don't you think? Yes, you do that. Good night, Mr. Dollar. The white ermine cape she was wearing and the black strapless thing needed a final touch. She had it. A diamond necklace. In fact, the tears of night, the one I had in my pocket, was hanging around her lovely neck. Downstairs, in the good light of the lobby, I snapped open the necklace case. Mortuous, it read, House of Jewelry. A gloomy word with a gloomy address. The sign on the window of the House of Mortuous gave a phone number in case of emergency. Item six, ten cents, one phone call about my emergency. I made it vague to Mr. Mortuous that thousands of people might die before 6 o'clock in the morning unless I could talk to someone about a piece of jewelry. It went over. Item 750 cents, cab fare to the Sandy Beach Hotel on the less expensive side of Miami Beach. You find me a bit indisposed, Mr. Dollar, but on the phone you said it was a matter of jewelry. Therefore, Hannibal Mortuous is at your service. Now then, sir, what is so urgent? I came to ask you about a diamond necklace. I found your name stamped on the inside of the case. House of Mortuous. A most respected name in diamonds as well as all the lapidary arts. Most respected. Fine jewels and the name Mortuous are... Oh, I do beg your pardon. Continue, Mr. Dollar. I want you to take a look at this. <laughs> and how, sir, do you come in possession of the tears of night? A man named Sam Costigan, who runs a gambling club, asked me to deliver it to a lady named Elise Wendover. Do you know her? A lovely body propelled by a ridiculous mind. This matter you have just described bears me out. For shame, such conduct. A gambling house. The tears of night are porn. Blech. Then this is the real thing. It isn't phony. Mr. Dollar, I'm a gemologist. The house of mortuous. Of course it's real. Take a good look. When an artist creates a dazzling thing of beauty such as this, would he be so unlikely as to forget the time, the patience, the agony of his creation? Eh? Eh? See here, look here, under the light. Four weeks, Mr. Dollar, four weeks working night and day just to drill that anchor for a simple molding. But, ah, see how each stone is carefully mounted to capture every single pinpoint of light. Beautiful, beautiful. An incomparable masterpiece for the money. Well, I'm just curious, Mr. Mortuous. How much money? About $10,000 on the wholesale market. What did Noah Wendover pay for it? 25000 I saw another one just like it tonight. They look ridiculous. The finest workman at best would only create a crude resemblance. This kind of artistry demands an artist, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> and I am that artist. But it could get by, a copy of it. To the unpracticed eye, to the layman perhaps, yes. Latet in anguis herba, Latin. 
Yeah, well, all I know is Agricola. A snake in the grass, eh? Something wrong? Yeah, mildly put, something wrong, yes. Well, how much do I owe you for your time, Mr. Mortuary? Oh, nothing, nothing. It was my pleasure. You know, glancing at that again reassures me of the value and dignity of my work. Anywhere it is magnificent. Uh, but I do outgrow. You say something is wrong. What? Mrs. Wendover, you say you met her. Several times. She ever mentioned anything to you about a curse? 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 No, I can't say that she did. I, may I ask you a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Are you a friend of hers? In a way, off and on. <laughs> I know what you mean. One is never quite certain with Mrs. Wendover whether one will be recognized or not is one. <laughs> well, it's late. Yeah, well, I'm just leaving. No, no, you, you, you misread me, sir. I wasn't speaking of my own comfort. I, I noticed the fog is coming. It is dark outside. This is a lonely area. Uh, that is a valuable object. Uh, are you armed? No. If you are at all concerned for the safety of that piece, I have a small safe in my rooms. You may have the key if you'd care to leave it overnight. I'll take it with me. Yeah, yeah. Well, just as well, probably. Suggestion only. You will leave satisfied, I trust, Mr. Dollar? Oh, Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mortuous. My pleasure, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> remember, omnia mortuous bonum vocal est. Uh. All speak well and mortuous. A pun, sir, a pun. Good evening. Downstairs in the dismal lobby of the Sandy Beach Hotel, I looked out beyond the dirty glass windows to discover that the fog had indeed come in and surrounded the area with a choking darkness. The concern of Mr. Mortuous for his artistic creation told me to bang on the night bell and ask the night clerk for some wrapping paper and 50 cents worth of stamps. Expense account item eight. Item nine, phone call for a cab. Just before it arrived, I dropped the tears of night addressed to myself at my hotel in the lobby mailbox. I don't think the two hoodlums waiting outside saw me do it. I didn't think they saw me at all. But they followed my cab when it took me back to my hotel. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, and the old curse comes up with an old-fashioned flourish. See you then. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Your number is ringing, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Hello? This is Johnny Dollar. You went back to Hartford. I meant to, but I got tied up in Mrs. Wendover's business affairs again. Uh, what now? Can you come over to my hotel right away? It's one o'clock in the morning. I know it. Well, can't you grab a cab and come over here? Hardly. Why not? A couple of Sam Costigan's boys followed me here. I think they might like to do a little target practice on me. Oh. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to... The Universal Adjustment Bureau, 518 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. Expenses continued. Items 10 and 11. $10, scotch and soda, plus a pitcher of ice and glasses. I had them filled, chilled, and waiting when Hillary Fuchs knocked on the door of my room. His eyes were still puffy with sleep, and he had a trench coat thrown over his pajamas. What's this all about, Johnny? You said Mrs. Wendover, somebody followed you, what? I want you to tell me what you can about the Tears of Night. The Tears of what? Tears of Night, a piece of jewelry owned by Mrs. Wendover, a necklace, four diamonds on black onyx, silver chain. What the devil would I know about something like that? In her accounts, her bills, her property? You're her business manager, you must know something about it. I never heard of it. You better straighten me out. Uh, try some of that. <laughs> <laughs> This is all too fast for me. Okay, I'll bring you up to date. I came here day before yesterday to investigate Mrs. Wendover's claim as beneficiary of the death of her husband. 
She forgot to file it for two years. Now, you explain why. I bought that. It's a legitimate claim. But I didn't buy her story about being cursed, or I didn't buy your idea that she was on the verge of blowing her top. No, I'm not so sure. I'm just along for the ride. Well, you left me in your office last night. A little while after you left, a man named Frank Scanlon came in and stuck a gun at me and said Sam Costigan wanted to see me. Costigan, the gambler? The same. Scanlon thought I was you. He took me over to Costigan's place. What's this got to do with insurance? Nothing. But it has something to do with Mrs. Wendover. Costigan had a necklace, the tears of night there. He said Mrs. Wendover left it as a pawn a week or so ago. Oh? He told me Mrs. Wendover called up and threatened to come out with policemen unless Costigan returned it. And as long as I was there, Costigan asked me to take it to her. I went over to her place, and what do you know? She was wearing the tears of night. I don't get this. Well, have another drink, neither do I. By the time I got there to her apartment, Mrs. Wendover hardly remembered my name or that we'd met in your office. She was waiting for her boyfriend to show up. Incidentally, his name's Teddy Davis. Is he after her money or what? Search me. I never met him. Well, I skipped out of there and looked up the jeweler who'd made the necklace, a man named Hannibal Mortuous. I heard of him. He speaks Latin or something. That's the one. He told me the necklace I had was the real thing. Now, I want you to tell me who made up the one Mrs. Wendover was wearing. I don't know anything about it. Well, it had to be made up sometime within the last week, and you've been handling her business affairs. I don't know a thing about it, Johnny. (sighs) All right, come here. Take a look. Do you know anything about those two birds outside there? No. Well, one of them's a character named Feely. He works for Costigan. The other one I saw at Costigan's club. They tailed me from Mortuous's place. Probably been on me all night long since I picked up the necklace. Where is it now? I mailed it to myself from Mortuous's hotel. <sighs> Those two out there, you better call the police if you think they're after you. Oh, nothing I could tell the police that would hold them up half a second. Mainly, I wanted to ask you about all this before I went on with it. What do you mean, go on with it? Go back to Mrs. Wendover, to Costigan, find out what's real and what isn't real? This isn't your line of duty. Why? Oh, I've been thinking about that. I don't know why. Maybe it's Mrs. Wendover, those eyes of hers, and that talk about the curse. I got a feeling she needs help in this matter. Somehow she needs help. What can I do, Johnny? Go to bed. I'll let you know what happens. Now, where's your car? In the parking lot back of the hotel. Give me the keys. I'll use that. Hey. Make yourself at home, Mr. Fuchs. Go to bed here. Oh. Yeah? Every now and then, walk over and look out that window and have a drink. They'll think it's me, and that's a good thought for them to have. Okay, what else? Well, if they start for the lobby, call downstairs and have them send up the house man and get the police. I don't think they will, but remember that. Well, why would they want... They still think I've got that piece of jewelry on me. We shook up another drink, and I borrowed Fuchs's trench coat and left. I found his green Chevy without too much trouble, since there weren't too many cars out in the lot that time of morning. I looked at my watch, and it said 2.35... I drove around front past the two hoodlums, still keeping up their silent vigil, and found a street that looked familiar. Twenty minutes later, I was in the parking lot beside Elise Wendover's apartment building. It was still dark, still foggy, and too late I found out too crowded. Somehow, the pair of hoodlums were waiting for me after all. Hey, this is him, Feely. Got a match, dollar? Toby asked you if you got a match. He's a dummy, Toby. Don't answer. Got a match, dollar? What'd I tell you? He's a dummy boy. You don't look like no dummy boy. You're nearsighted. Take your hands off. He's a dummy, all right, ain't you, dollar? See, Toby? I told him about you being nearsighted and he wouldn't answer. He don't talk. Go on, smart boy. Tell Toby how sorry you are about him being nearsighted. Talk. I heard you talk before told you he was a dummy. Hey, uh, tell me something, dummy. All insurance guys like you? Toby asked you a question. He wants to know if all insurance guys are like you. I don't like him. He asked questions and he ain't told us nothing. Hey, uh, maybe we find out something we went through his pockets, huh? Yeah, yeah. Even a dummy's got pockets. Ain't that right, dummy? Hold him, Toby. Yeah. All right, boys, you played the scene good and I'll see what I can do for you, but I haven't got the necklace. <laughs> Hey, he talks. Yeah, yeah, you make him talk again, Toby. (laughs) Now, don't make him talk too much. We know if the stuff ain't on him, it's in his room. We can pick it up anytime. (laughs) That's it. Easy, Toby, easy. (laughs) 
Oh, he talks real nice, Feely, but he don't say much. Hey, you think maybe he's tough? Could be. No, I wasn't. And I didn't feel like talking in that quiet little parking lot where the only noise was them pounding on me. I told them I didn't have the necklace anymore, but they didn't care about that. They wanted to find out the hard way. The hard way for me. I remember trying to wake up a couple of times. I dreamed I was driving along in a big Cadillac. Frank Scanlon was on one side of me, Sam Costigan on the other. Hannibal Mortuous was in the front seat. He had his jeweler's glass out, looking at the tears of night. I tried to see who was behind the steering wheel, and I gave that up because the steering wheel was a roulette wheel. Then we had a blowout, and the whole car vanished with everybody screaming, Demortuous, Demortuous. Somewhere around six in the morning, I began to get a feeling, several feelings, and all of them hurt. And it just turned dawn, and I rolled over on my side to watch a man who hadn't seen me step into his car with a fresh shave and a fishing pole, pull out of the lot and disappear. Somewhere, vaguely, I heard the sounds of early morning traffic. Streetcar clang somewhere. Nothing much happened for a while. Then it came to me it might be a good idea to get on my feet and find a telephone and get hold of a doctor and see how long I had to live. Somehow I managed by holding onto a fence and stumbling against cars to make the front entrance to Elise Wendover's house. I made the elevator, self-service my way up to the ninth floor and staggered toward 913. I would have been better off in the parking lot. Elise Wendover was there, sitting in a large chair by the window. She still wore the black strapless dress and ermine piece she'd had on the night before. The drapes were drawn, the door was slightly open. Light from the hall seeped in. She had a telephone on her lap. The receiver was off, held idly in one hand. She looked at me. <laughs> but she was looking at nothing. Oh. Hello. Hello, oh, Mr. Dollar, it's you. You've been in an accident. You're hurt. I don't think you'll need this. Oh. Well, then, Mr. Dollar. Well, then, I suppose you've met some people tonight who know a great deal about me. A gambler? A jeweler? Did they tell you about Teddy Davis? He's really a dear, Mr. Dollar. Quite the nicest boy I've met since Noah died on the boat. Noah and I had so many things together, Mr. Dollar. I do think he enjoyed being alive with me. I mean, I cried when Noah died. I really did. I cried like a little baby. Of course, I cried when I heard my brother was killed in Korea and when Daddy died in his office with a heart attack. I shouldn't really cry anymore. I mean, after all, I am cursed. I told you that. Yes, I told you I didn't believe it. There's no such thing. But there is. You'll see. Mrs. Wendover. No, I have Teddy. He's really a dear. I do think he will be a very prominent artist someday. He paints you. No? Teddy asked me to marry him tonight. That's nice. You marry him. And Teddy isn't interested in my money. Could you believe that? What is my mom? <laughs> I can't seem to get my tongue adjusted to my mouth. Did that ever happen to you, Mr. Todd? Yes, sometimes. Perhaps I should see a correctionist. I... I'm glad you came by again, Mr. Dollar. I told you once that sometimes, sometimes it means an awfully, awfully lot to speak to someone. Mr. Costigan. Mr. What? Dollar. What about Mr. Costigan? Later. 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 I know it must be strange to you, but, 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 but some people live for nothing but money and some people to die for it. Stop it. Stop it! Now tell me what's happened. Tell me what's happened so I can help you. They do look so funny. They're so very funny. I've seen them count money so often and so much money, and I really believe that it's honestly all they live for, only, only, only. <laughs> She pointed across the darkened room. Her black eyes glistened with no semblance of reason left in them. It took me five seconds to find the light switch. Stretched out on the floor of her apartment. They look funny, all right. Feely and Toby... Both of them as dead as you can get. (laughs) 
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the tears of night come home. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Good morning, darling. Hello, hello. We should get married today. Is your name Teddy Davis? What? Who is this? Where's Elise? My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm in her apartment. What? Hey, what? Now listen to me. I'm an insurance investigator, and there have been a couple of murders here. Murders? In Elise's apartment? She's going to need you and all the help she can get to bring her out of it. Mostly you. I've called homicide, and they're on their way, and it might be pretty rough for her. I'll be right over. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. It was a long morning, and a lieutenant of police thought I was crazy when he met me in the apartment with two dead men and the hysterical woman. My face was bruised and black and blue from the beating the dead men had handed me the night before. The lieutenant, his name was Brady, had a time getting hold of Hillary Fuchs to back up my story. But Teddy Davis was a different matter. He showed up with a doctor and lawyer... And through their combined efforts, Elise Wendover was removed not to police headquarters, but to a private hospital. It was obvious from powder tests that Mrs. Wendover could not have fired the forty-five, which ended the lives of Feely and Toby. Obvious to me. Lieutenant Brady was a skeptical man. You stay right there and keep your trap shut. I'll figure out what to do with you in a minute. All right, come on, get those baskets out of here. I say, Dollar... Hi, Teddy. How's Mrs. Wendover? Well, that remains to be seen. She's screaming about that darn curse again. She thinks she had something to do with these murders... Dollar, I, I don't know quite how you fit into all this. I do know I'm terribly indebted to you for calling me. Now, what can I do for you? Are you in trouble? I don't think so. Brady's just excited. He can't see where I should be involved, so he suspects me. Of what? Oh, he doesn't know that. He's a policeman, and he suspects everybody. But don't you worry about it. You get back to her. Oh, I really do have a good lawyer. He can work on it if you give the word. I can't just walk out of here feeling that you're in jeopardy. Now, what can I do? I thought you were over at the hospital, Mr. Davis. I was. I came back to see what I could do for Mr. Dollar. You can scram now. Watch whom you're talking to, Lieutenant. This man is my friend. Hey, are you kidding? Not a bit. Take it easy, fellas. Take it easy. You said your name's Dollar. Insurance dick. Let's see your buzzer. Okay. Out of Hartford. What's the job? Mrs. Wendover's husband died two years ago. She just got around to filing for benefits last week. We were curious about it. Go on. Well, can't you see, Mrs. Wendover? Let him, huh? As near as I can make out, Mrs. Wendover's overlooked a lot of things since her husband's death. Taxes, bank accounts, whatnot. Hillary Fuchs can tell you that much. This curse business she mumbles about. Well, she lost her husband. Before that, her brother killed in the war, and her father before that. You know, you don't seem to pay much attention. I explained all of it. I'm going to pop you in the cooler if you open your mouth again, Mr. Davis. (laughs) Go on, how about the insurance? Well, all okay. I was ready to leave town last night. As a matter of fact, I'd called for a plane from Fuchs' office. When a man named Scanlon came in, mistook me for Fuchs, and said Sam Costigan wanted to see me. Costigan's got a gambling place on the other side. Yeah, 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 we know about it. Go on. Well, Costigan gave me a necklace, the tears of night, said it belonged to Mrs. Wendover. He asked me to bring it back to her, said she'd pawned it at the roulette table. When I got here, Mrs. Wendover was wearing the tears of night, or something that looked just like it. Well, I was curious. I looked up the jeweler who had made it, a man named Mortuous. He said I was carrying the real thing. When I left his place, a couple of men from Costigan's place followed me. Who? Those two who were killed, Feely and Toby. They caught up with me outside of this apartment house and tried to shake me down for the necklace. But I'd mailed it to myself at my hotel. So they worked me over and left me there. When I came to earlier this morning, I came up here and found Mrs. Wendover sitting here in a state of shock. The two stiffs in her room. That's it? Yeah, Brady, that's it. How long you been an insurance dick? Fourteen years. You bonded? Yes. Okay. Are you going to let him go or aren't you? Shut up. Shut up and I'll tell you both what I'm up against here. I know Mrs. Wendover couldn't have had anything to do with the killings. I know you, Dollar, couldn't either. Then go out and find who killed those two men. Those two and the other one. 
Huh? Costigan was gunned down a couple of hours ago. About three o'clock in the afternoon, Brady released me and Teddy Davis drove me back to my hotel. The clerk at the desk looked at my bandaged face and turned eight shades of white when he handed me my key. I thanked him and told him I'd kept a date with a barracuda. I was feeling kiddish, also a little dizzy and a little tired. I was looking forward to a hot shower and ten hours sleep when I walked in my room. Oh, Dollar, I've been expecting you. Come in, sir, come in. Oh. Hello, Mr. Mortuous. Uh, I've been uh, amusing myself with this pocket chess set of yours. Mexican, eh? Sit down, sit down. You've had a hectic night. Your boys were pretty rough, Mr. Mortuous. Philly and uh, Toby are two men of another world, Mr. Dollar. Not of our world. Allow me to apologize for their actions. I want more than an apology. They almost beat me to death. And so unnecessary, too. You know, I underestimated you, Mr. Dollar. Such an ingenious method of protecting the tears of night. Why, sir, by the simple expedient of placing it in an envelope and mailing it to yourself from my hotel lobby, you hired as guardians the entire United States Postal Service, not to mention the armed forces. Yeah. Want one of these? No, 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 thanks. I'm one of those faint-hearted persons who cannot abide liquor until after six in the afternoon. What happens now? Do we wait for the mail? We do. Precisely. Then while we're waiting, maybe you'll be kind enough to tell me about the double cross. <laughs> if you can bear my vanity, Mr. Dollar, I, I have invented a new word, triple cross. It has a ring to it, eh? That sounds likely. You see, Mr. Scanlon approached me last week and asked me to duplicate the tears of night Mrs. Wendover had truly pawned at the gaming table. Naturally, I became suspicious. Let me guess what you became suspicious of. Oh, well, it was fairly obvious that Mr. Scanlon was planning to double-cross Mr. Costigan. That is, when the time came to return Mrs. Wendover's necklace, he, Scanlon, I mean, uh, intended to return the bogus piece I made up. And you got into the act. Uh, that is when I first conceived my own plans, yes. Unfortunately, Mr. Costigan learned of the little deceit going on around him, and Mr. Scanlon was forced to shoot him. So Scanlon shot Costigan how about Toby and Feely? Uh, Mrs. Scanlon again, abetted by the last of the house of Mortius. You helped him kill them, then planted them, and Elise went over his apartment. Oh, dear, a crude touch, I thought, but it had a purpose. With two cadavers in her living room, she was very unlikely to discuss her bogus necklace with the police. And I doubt very much if she knew whether she was wearing the original or an imitation. Flighty girl. That's the lousiest thing the house of Mortuous ever did. She walked in and found these two there, and the doctor doesn't know whether she'll ever be sane again. Oh, dear, dear, dear. If you had merely returned the necklace to Mrs. Wendover, it would have been a simple thing to effect an exchange, and none of this would have been necessary. Ah, uh, well, then, bygones are bygones. Yeah, sure, I know. You just sit here and wait for the mail. No, 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 no. We wait for the mail. What about your playmate, Scanlon? Why isn't he waiting with you? Scanlon? I'm afraid I'll be sought for a murder of two or three this night. I'm certain the police will find his body before the day is out, but I did need him to help me carry the bodies to Elise Wendover's apartment. Uh, Elise. Uh, tell me something, Mr. Dollar. Does that name Elise bother you as much as it bothers me? Uh, give me a woman with a name like Celeste or Josephine or Roxanne. <laughs> Those, sir, are names for the creatures. But Elise, yeah, twaddle. Where are the police going to find Scanlon? Oh, in my hotel room, which I departed hastily once the room clerk had informed me of your ingenious method for protecting the necklace. I shot him there. Oh, you work cheap, Mr. Mortuous. Cheap, sir? I don't understand. A $10,000 necklace. It's not quite a king's ransom, is it? <laughs> the tears of night are worth closer to $100,000. I'm afraid I misinformed you as to their value. I didn't want you to become suspicious. I suppose you think you'll get away with it. Oh, well, I'm an old man. Attended to a destitute and bankrupt jewelry firm with nothing ahead. A few grim years and finally a whimpering end. Requiescit in passe. Ah, live. That's what I want to do, live. And this is my opportunity to live like a king. And young man, I've taken it. Many. Vidi Vici. Oh, you're crazy. You're crazier than a mosquito in December, Mr. Mortuous. <laughs> They'll grab you before you make the airport. No, I don't think they will. <laughs> I shall leave here and turn the tears of night into cash. With a well-laden purse, I shall guarantee to elude the police over half the world. In two years, maybe three, ah, oh, yes, they'll get me. But I'll have spent the money. And what more could a man ask than a perfect fulfillment of all his wishes, eh? I ask you, sir, as one gentleman to another, 
What more could a man ask? I... Cautious, Mr. Dollar. I do shoot well. Answer it. Tell them to go away. I'll be right beside you. All right. Open it. One side, Dollar. I got a gun. Scanlon. I thought I'd find you waiting for the mail. You dirty... You didn't do such a good job on me. Caution, Mr. Scanlon. I have a gun to... I'll last long enough to let you have it. Your loss of blood has made you groggy, Mr. Scanlon. Uh, but still good enough. <laughs> Scanlon rolled over and lay still. Watch was kind of grunted and uh, leaned back against the wall. Uh, he had a pained look on his face. Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Mr. Dollar. I do believe I've been shot. I'll, I'll need a little assistance. I, 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 I can't seem to hold my feet, sir. I can't seem to hold my feet. Sir. I still. It, it, it was an awkward plan at best, eh? <laughs> Demotuous nil nisi bonum, Dollar. What if your Latin still escapes you? Speak well of the dead. Let me have the police. Expense account. Well... Expense account total, $405.16. Details, Mrs. Wendover will recover. Remarks, I'll stand for the last two days of expense myself. I didn't have any business sticking my nose in the jewelry end of it. But if you make me pay for them, don't ever try to hire me again. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the matter of a reasonable doubt. A case of many doubts, and believe me, all of them are most unreasonable. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Jane Avello, William Conrad, Frank Gerstle, Marvin Miller, and Will Wright. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fotina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Mm-hmm.